he, he got through Bible college and, and he got his degree and he got ordained as a minister and he got his bachelor's degree. And this is something he dropped out of school. Didn't have an education. Didn't want to go to school. That God has done a tremendous work in him. Mentally and spiritually, physically. He's now married. My, my, my beautiful lady, Celeste. Who has their baby on the way. Amen. We're excited about that. Little Z. So, I told her I was going to call her up. And she said, I'm ready, you know. I stay ready. So I said, all right, all right, all right. You know, she's from New York. So I thought you got to tone her down. But... I want you guys to stand to your feet, and I want you guys to give it up for my nephew Z. Come on, Z. Let's give Jesus some praise in this place. As we were sharing the testimonies of the people getting healed at the awakening, I begin to revive in my spirit, and I begin to thank Jesus that he calls us out of a natural lifestyle into a supernatural lifestyle. Do I have anybody in this place that knows that they were created for the supernatural lifestyle that God had predestined for them? Do I have anybody in this place that said I was born for something more? I was created to change the world. I was created to do something great. I'm a history maker. I'm a city taker. I'm a world shaker. Thank God that he called me out of my depression into a lifestyle of revival, into a lifestyle of love, into a lifestyle of peace. See, sometimes you just got to thank him for the simple things. Sometimes you got to thank him for the simple things. I hear a lot of times we thank him for the healings and this person, their leg grew out. But sometimes I sit there and I just thank God that I have peace now because I remember a time when I was depressed. And I remember a time when I would wake up in the morning and I didn't know what to do with my life because I didn't know what the purpose was for my life. But Jesus came. Oh, so you didn't catch it. I said, but Jesus came. And when Jesus shows up, when Jesus shows up, you can do one of two things. Everybody say one of two things. You can do one of two things. You can celebrate Jesus or you can tolerate Jesus. You can choose to celebrate the presence of God in your life or you can choose to just tolerate the presence of God in your life. What I'm talking about is in the Bible, King David, the ark of the Lord was coming into the city, the city of David. The ark of the Lord represented the presence of God at that time. And as the ark of the Lord's coming in, the Bible says that David began to dance. David began to run around. David began to get passionate. David began to get vibrant. David came alive. But then, check this out. David started to act a fool. And he started, the Bible says this, that David took off his kingly garments. Do you understand that David was a king? So it was foolish for him to act like that. It was foolish for him to dance like that because he had a reputation. But the Bible says that when David got into the presence of the Lord, he took off the kingly garments. See, some of you need to take off your pride. You need to take off your ego. And you need to just jump into the fire. You need to just jump into the joy that God has for you. Jump into the peace that God has for you. And so he began to take off these kingly garments. And the Bible said that David put on the, the garments of which were a servant's garment. See, David understood, I know I'm a king, but when I come into the presence of God, I'm a kid. See, some of you guys don't understand that God's not just high, this high and mighty God. He cares about your situation. He's your father. And when you get into the presence of God, you're not a king anymore. You're a kid. And the Bible says this. Check this out. His wife, by the name of Michal, who should have been down there praising with him. Somebody needs to tell their wife or their husband, you better come up and praise with me. You better come up to the front and start dancing with me. I'm tired of looking stupid on my own. You better get up here and start lifting your hands with me. I'm tired of you being complacent. You need to get on fire with me. And so, Mikael, his wife, the Bible says, is looking, is looking through a window at what David's doing. As he's acting a fool and he's dancing. Here's the only problem about looking through a window. It means you're not actually in the movement. The problem with his wife looking through the window was that she wasn't actually on the ground dancing with him. And the Bible says this, that she began to persecute David in her heart. The Bible says she despised him at heart. And check this out, when David got home from dancing and worshiping and praising, she began to say, what a fool of you to take off your kingly robes. What a fool of you to take off your crown. 
What a fool of you to start dancing like a fool. And David looked at her and he said, my dear, I'm sorry, but this was for the Lord. It wasn't about you. It wasn't about them. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about looking nice. It wasn't about putting on makeup so I can come to the awakening. It wasn't about dressing up. It wasn't about my title. It wasn't about my position. But it was about the presence of King Jesus. When it shows up, you don't want to cry because it's going to mess up your makeup. We pray for revival, but when it shows up, we don't got the time for it because we got somewhere to go. Make room for the king. If you ask for the king, make room for him. Because what you're asking for might shift your whole entire life. So be careful when you pray for God to change your life. Be careful when you pray for God to do a work in your heart. Because when God shows up, nothing's the same. Do you understand that when God shows up, nothing's the same? Come on. A tax collector in the Bible by the name of Levi. Go ahead. Come on. Tax collectors were despised at that time. Come on, and Levi sat at the table. Jesus showed up to Levi, never met Levi. Jesus calls Levi. Levi decides to respond. Come on. Come on. See, all of us in here tonight, the presence of God's in this place. I said the presence of God's in this place. And you're going to have an option. You can have a choice whether you want to respond to the presence of God or you want to reject the presence of God. And Levi, the tax collector who doesn't even know this man, this man that doesn't have much to offer him physically. Because check this out, when Jesus called you back in the day, his messages didn't go like this. Come to me and I'll give you a new car. Come to me and I'll bless you. His messages were this. Come, pick up your cross, follow me, and you're going to walk with me through some of the hardest And the Bible says Jesus called Levi. Levi stands up out of his tax collector's seat and goes and follows Jesus. And then from that very moment, his name was changed to Matthew. Do you understand that when Jesus shows up, things change? Do you understand that you cannot leave this place? Listen to me. You cannot afford to leave this place the same. You have the opportunity of a lifetime. The Bible says tomorrow is promised to no man. You have the opportunity to get in touch with the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe. If you're an orphan in this place, if you've had a dad or a mom that's never been there for you, you have an opportunity to have a dad tonight. And can I tell you something? He's perfect. Oh, you know, I just, I'm so hurt. My dad did this and my dad did that to me. My heavenly father doesn't do that to me. See, I have a new dad. I have a new family. It's called the family of Christ. It's called the family of God. So I can't make excuses anymore why I'm not grown. I can't make excuses anymore why I'm not saying yes to Jesus because he's the answer to every single one of my problems. Come on, come on, come on. See, Levi sat, my friend Chris says this, Levi sat, Jesus called, Matthew followed. You get that? You see, in this place tonight, depression came in and sat. Yeah, I'm talking to some depressed people in here. Suicide came in and sat. Pornography came in and sat, but I'm here to tell you something. Jesus is calling, and what's going to walk out isn't going to be the same thing that walked in. See, depression might have walked in, but clarity's going to walk out. Depression might have walked in, but joy's going to walk out. Pornography might have walked in, but freedom's going to walk out. Whatever you came in with, you don't want to leave with. That's the Jesus we serve. He changes everything. That's right. He changed my life. When I was 15 years old in the streets of San Jose, doing drugs, I was a drug addict. And my mom told me one day, she goes, you're, you're getting so bad, I'm just gonna send you away. I'm like, where am I gonna go? She's like, you're gonna go to the Ben's home. That's Nino Ben, by the way. Not the men's home, but the Ben's home. And so I said, all right, I'll go. Not knowing really what I was getting myself into. But when I got to the Awakening 209 in that small little house, I met the lover of my soul. And God began to break chains of addiction on me in my life. And God began to show me I have a call for you. God began to show me I have a plan for you, a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. And I'm here to share with you the same exact thing that happened to me. It can happen to you tonight. God's got a plan for your life. You're not a mistake. God created you with a purpose. And then I gave my life to Christ. 
giving my life to Christ, he started to show me you're gonna do music. You're gonna be used for my glory. So I just obedient writing songs, just obedient writing songs. Can I tell you that some of these songs have reached millions of people? The same kid that people used to call that little drug addict, the same kid that people used to look at as a nobody, the same kid that people, all they knew me for was a little thief, that same kid were now being called a blessing to the nations. It doesn't matter what people make at you. It doesn't matter what your mama said about you. It doesn't matter what your uncle said about you. Jesus has a different name for you. Jesus has a call for your life. Jesus loves you. Good, you answer the call of God, you'll make history. Come on. Anybody in here want to make history? Come on. I want to talk to you about three men tonight that made history. Romans 12, 1 says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, say holy, holy. and acceptable to God which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Can I tell you, you weren't created to fit in into the Bible. If you look like everybody else, then you might not be following the real Jesus. Listen. Talking about being transformed, not conforming to this world. Do you understand we live in a culture, we live in a generation that everybody wants to fit in? A culture and a generation that our youth will do anything that it costs for them to just fit in and feel accepted. A culture and a generation where if you want to be in a gang, you're willing to let them jump you, beat you up so you can feel a part of their family. That's not love. A culture and a generation where young girls, if they want to fit in with this type of crowd, they got to wear skimpy dresses and they got to look a certain way and they got to put on certain makeup. I'm telling you, we live in a generation that the devil has told a lie to that we were created to fit in. The devil has lied to us and we bought the lie that we were created to fit in. But I'm believing that there's a generation of young people, old people, middle-aged people that knows that they are created to rise up, that knows that they are created to be different, that knows that they are created to be a chosen people. He said, you're a royal priesthood. That's what he said about me and you. A chosen people. You know what else he said in that scripture? A peculiar people. Everybody say peculiar. Anybody want to know what that means? It means belonging exclusively to. See, if I'm chosen to be a, a peculiar people, that means I've got to belong exclusively to something. See, the problem with this generation is we got commitment issues. You don't want to belong exclusively to somebody. That's why you're texting that guy and then you go text the other guy the next night because you don't want to truly belong exclusively to something. But you know what God's saying is if you want to be a follower of me, if you want to call yourself a Christian, you got to belong exclusively to me. I'm not going to have any other gods. A chosen people, a peculiar people. I'm not going to share. I'm not going to be shared. That's what God's saying today. Let me talk to you about let me talk to you about three men who made history because they chose not to conform to the world, but they chose to stand out. First of all, you gotta believe that you were born to stand out. You gotta really believe. I want somebody to say that I was born to stand out. I was born to look different. You were created in the image of God. Three men, everybody say three, who chose to rise up and not fit in with the culture. Here we go. It says this, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was 90 feet tall and its width was 9 feet wide. King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the administrators, the governors, the counselors, and all the officials of the arena to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Does anybody in this place know that the devil's setting up images in our culture that the devil wants us to bow to? Are you catching the picture of what I'm trying to break down? Then an official cried loud, to you it's commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, and harp, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship. Everybody say worship. Tell your neighbor, say, be careful what you worship. 
They worship the gold image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then it says, And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Somebody say, throw me in the fire. Let me talk to you today about a few different gods that the devil's setting up in our culture and our generation in order to get us to bow to him. You want to talk about money? I'm talking about sex. I'm talking about pornography. I'm talking about the devil lying to this culture and telling them it's okay to just sleep around with your boyfriend and girlfriend. The devil lying to this culture and saying you can still be a Christian, but you can still sleep around with your boyfriend and girlfriend. You can still be a Christian and turn up on the Saturday night. You can still be a Christian and drink all you want. You can still be a... How about this one? It's okay to be gay and be a Christian at the same time. I'm talking about these gods. These images that the devil is setting up in our culture, in our generation, that's trying to get us to bow. Let me talk to you about this fire that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up in order to get everybody to bow. If you study this furnace, this furnace was used to bend the metal when they needed a tool to be bent. This furnace was used in order to shape or mold something when they needed to be shaped or molded in a certain fashion. And I'm here to tell you tonight, prophetically speaking, the devil wants to begin to shape and mold your convictions. The devil wants to begin to shape and mold the things that you stand strong for, the biblical truth of God's word. The devil wants to shape it, and he wants to take it, and he wants to say things are okay when they're really not okay. See, the same fire that they used to shape metal was the same fire Nebuchadnezzar was trying to use to shape their convictions. He wanted, he wanted them to bend to his way. He wanted them to bend to how he wanted things in the city. But I believe that there's a generation rising up that's not going to bend, that's not going to break, that's not going to be walking according to what the devil wants, but that's going to stay loyal to the word of God. The Bible says it in the end days. People will be driven away by every form of doctrine. And in this day and age, we have doctrine saying it's okay. You can do whatever you want, live like the devil, you can sleep with the devil, and then still with your tongue worship Jesus on Sunday. Come on, Come on. I don't know about you, but my Bible doesn't say that I can pick up my cross on one arm and pick up my sin in the other and just walk it all out like it's okay. My Bible says to pick up my cross, deny myself, live selfishly, die to myself, kill my sin so I can live for Jesus. Just because everybody else is doing it, just because your friends are doing it, don't make it God's word. I'm not with Hollywood Christianity. I'm with Hollywood Christianity. I just made that right now. Anybody here that says, I'm not going with Hollywood Christianity. I'm going with Hollywood Christianity. If it ain't right with the word, match it up with the word. If it's not right with the word, Come on. Come on, see. Notice how the king used. What did the king use in order to get everybody to bow? When you hear the music. Yeah, I'm gonna hit somebody's button tonight. You was on your way over here listening to the Tupac. Mama Music. Music gets people to bow. Oh, it's just the beat, but you're bowing to what the person is saying. Oh, well, it's just a beat, brother. I just want to listen to the beat, but you're bowing to that person who's leading you into worship when they're telling that girl to do what they want that girl to do. See, music's more powerful than you think. Music's so powerful, I might spit a 16 bar right now. See, we're talking about the Bible, right? Are we talking about the Bible? Where's my Bible? We're talking about how it's this is right here. This is our standard. Amen. This is the standard of God. Not what people say, not what doctrines say, but what the word of God, the living word of God says. I don't know about you, but I'm all about my paper. I'm not talking about money in my pocket. I'm talking about the paper of the living word of God. P-A-P-E-R. You ready? This is what the Bible is. The P is for the promises I possess in his paper. I stay reading 
Johnson, that's Magic with the Lakers. The A is affirmation I receive from the Father when I dive into these pages and take heed to the I. The, I. the second piece for the prophecies in the paper. No weapon for can prosper, no stopping me with the Savior. The E, that's because Jesus reigns to the end. So many self proclaimed gods, but he didn't came to the end. I don't want to down the gospel. We really need repentance. We all guilty of our sin. You don't want to receive your sentence. I'm all about my paper, bro. Better get your paper up. Sharper than a double. Because you know why? Music's a part of our body. Yeah. As you heard in the beginning of the, the first scripture I read, it says to offer up your body, a holy and living sacrifice. What are you letting in your ears? What are you letting your eyes see? We're called to offer up our bodies, a holy and living sacrifice unto God. Let me tell you how powerful music is. This lady came up to me after a service one time and she just, she sent me, she, she wrote it on a note because she doesn't speak English. And the note said this, and she had somebody with her that she was holding her hand. It was her daughter. And the note said, hey Z, I wrote this note because I don't speak English and I wanna let you know, my daughter, she's been deaf since the day she was born. Never been able to hear in her life. But somehow, some way, when I play your CD in the car, she begins to dance to the beat and she begins to lift her hands and she begins to get excited. See, let me tell you that music can make you come alive or music can bring death. Music can bring life or music can bring death. Can I tell you that movies can bring life or movies can bring death? Come on, G. See, your yes to Jesus will change history. See, your yes to Jesus will change history. Then it says this, here we go, let's get on with the story. Therefore at that time, it said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. Somebody tell the devil, I don't owe nothing to you. See, look at, this is funny. They said, he, they have not paid due regard to you, like if Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego owed the king something. You don't owe nothing to the devil. You don't owe the devil an apology. You don't owe the devil a sorry. All he does is wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. And you were created to steal, kill, and destroy him. They have not paid due regard to you. Everybody say three men. Just say they say, I won't bow. So these three men, as everybody, when the, when the music is played, all of a sudden, everybody's dropping down. You just see everybody dropping what they're doing. Go there with me. No matter what you're doing, you drop what you're doing, you get down on your knees and you bow when the music's played. And you know that if you don't bow in that same hour, you're gonna be thrown into a fiery furnace. So can you imagine Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego who served God, who loved God, who knew that they were committed to God, who knew that they weren't going to be unloyal to God, who knew that they were going to stand for God no matter what? Can you imagine what's going through their mind as the music's beginning to play and everybody's starting to drop, but there's three men that are going to make history because they're not going to drop? Can I tell you we wouldn't be talking about them if they didn't stand up? If they fell in line with the rest of the people and they just sat down, we would never have heard of their names. See, your generations after you won't even know who you are if you don't stand up for Jesus. My kids, my grandkids, my great-grandkids will never know who I am if I don't stand up for Jesus. You know why? Because the only people that ever make history are people that are willing to rise up. You want to make history, you got to be willing to rise up. When everybody else is going one way, you got to be the one that says, no, I'm going this way. When everybody else is drinking, when everybody else is smoking, you got to say, I'm going to be praying, I'm going to be reading. So you'll never make history if you don't rise up. As everybody's starting to drop, you see these three men just standing there. And, and then what? People don't know what to do with you. That's what happened. Did you catch that? People don't know what to do with you. See that nobody around them told them anything. They had to go get a higher authority because they didn't know what to do. Can I tell you that you're so scared of your friends knowing that you're a Christian? You're so afraid of your friends knowing the gospel. You're so afraid of being unashamed for the gospel. But when you actually be unashamed, they can't do nothing to you. They won't know what to do with you. They're going to let you preach because they won't know what else to do with you. My brother, his name's Danny. When we were in junior high, he 
Matt went to a, a youth service and he got super excited at this youth service because he got saved. And he told the youth leader, tomorrow at my school, I'm going to preach the gospel on the bench. I'm going to get up on the, on the chair and I'm going to preach the gospel. The very next day, my youth leader showed up on campus and said, you're going to do what you said you were going to do. And so Danny's in the cafeteria. There's thousands of kids in there. This cafeteria, all they did was go to the cafeteria during lunchtime. And my brother got up and my brother was shaking because I was standing right next to him. And I'm like, you scared? He's like, I'm so scared. But how many know you could be shaking in your boots but still doing the word of God? Still doing the will of God? You could be scared as heck, but you're still rising up. It's okay to be nervous, but as long as you don't stand down. And he got up on that table and he said, everybody check this out. And you could hear a pin drop. Nobody talked. Everybody just zoomed it right in on him. And he just began to preach the gospel. He said, my name's Danny. I went to a Bible study last night. God judged my life. And I want to let you know that Jesus loves you. That God has a plan for you. And can I tell you, if my brother would have never have done that, people wouldn't remember him. When I go to San Jose, till this day, people come up to me. And they say, hey, till this day, we're talking about 10 years down the line. Hey, aren't you, wasn't your brother the one that got up and preached the gospel? Can I tell you what you to the call of God, your grandkids are going to be like, hey, my great-grandmother did something great for the will of God. My grandmother did something great in the kingdom of God. My grandmother followed Jesus with all of her heart. She saved thousands of souls. He saves thousands of souls. Making history. Everybody say that. Say, I'm a history maker. See, if I would have never gave my heart to Christ, if I would have never said yes to him, 2.8 million people wouldn't have heard the gospel through a song for the Raiders. 2.8 million people wouldn't have heard the gospel for a song through the Raiders. And, it, and I thought about it one day and I said, God, thank you so much. And I began to break because I thought about the fact that God had this plan from before I was even born. That God had everything in my life of where I'm at today. The music I make, the ministry I have, God predestined this way before I was even born. He seen I was even born. You were predestined for greatness. You were predestined for greatness. Oh king, they have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Let me ask you something. Are people talking about you? I said, are people talking about you? If people aren't talking about you, maybe you're fitting in a little too much. If people aren't talking about you, maybe you're not causing the devil any ruckus enough. People begin, the word begin to spread because these three men chose not to rise up. I wonder how many people word begins to spread in our workplace. Word begins to spread in our school place. Is that you? I want people to know that when I step into the room, the atmosphere shifts because a man of God just walked in. The spirit of God just walked in. Freedom just walked in. Hope just walked in. Joy just walked in. We were at the barbershop today. And this guy came in with the calf saying that he can't recover from his surgery he had. He's having so much pain. And I didn't even get the chance to offer the to offer him to pray for him because Net did before me, my barber. He's all, oh, he'll pray for you. <laughs> I want to be that Christian when they say, hey, hey, go to Dave Nidum because I know that when Dave Nidum lays hands on somebody, the spirit of God begins to break out. We pray for him. And God healed him. That's it. Is that good enough? That's powerful. Here we go. And then it says this. King Nebuchadnezzar brought them together. Now if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of music. And you fall down and worship the image which I have made. Good. Nebuchadnezzar is telling them this. Everybody say won't bow down. He said. If you bow down. Good. But if you do not choose to worship. You shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God that will deliver you from my hands? Started to get sarcastic. I don't know about you, but I would have drop kicked him right there. It would have threw me in the furnace by myself. Now, this was crazy. Mocking their God. But check this out. And you better get excited on this part. It says this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God that we serve will deliver us from it. And 
he will deliver us from your hands. And then it says, but even if he does not, oh my Lord today, God is looking for an even if generation. An even if generation. That even if I do get persecuted, even if I do die for the gospel, even if I don't get blessed, even if it doesn't happen my way, I'm still going to serve him. For an even if generation that says, even if you don't bless me the way that I want to be blessed, I'm still going to serve you, God. Even if times I don't have food on the table, I'm still going to thank you in that time. Even if times I don't have the clothes that I want, I'm still going to praise you, God, because I'm an even if Christian. Are you an even if Christian? Ask yourself. Even if, he said. See, sometimes we like to praise God on the other side of the victory. Once he's brought us through the battle, once he's gave us the victory, once we win, it's easy to celebrate with the Super Bowl winning team, right? It's easy to start dancing around and be like, yo, we did it, just like how you do when your team wins the Super Bowl. You weren't even really on the team, you don't got no jersey, but you're just like, hey, we won. See, it's easy to start to celebrate after the victory. But Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, three men decided to praise and worship before the victory. They didn't even know if they were going to win. But you know what they said? Even if we don't win, even if we die, even if you kill us, I'm still on fire already. And even if generation, T.D. Jake says this, there's a difference between praisers and worshipers. Praise is when you thank God for your shoes. Praise is when you thank God for the shirt on your back. Everybody should praise God for what they have. Worship is when you say, God, I'm going to praise you for who you are, not what I have. I'm going to praise you for who you are, not what I have. So even if I don't got no shoes, even if I don't got no shirt on my back, even if it doesn't happen the way that I think it should, I'm still going to worship you for who you are. See, what you got to understand about these men is they were committed. That's, that's, that's a word you don't hear in our generation anymore. That's sad. You don't hear commitment in our generation anymore. But they were so committed to God. They were so committed to the vision. They were so loyal to the vision. They were so committed to the call of God on their life that they were willing to die for the gospel. You know why? Because Nebuchadnezzar threatened to throw them in the fire. They said, I'm already burning. Some of y'all didn't catch that. See, you wouldn't be scared of the fire if you're already on fire for God. You know what I'm saying? You wouldn't be scared of the fire if you're already burning for Jesus. Because you said, I've already died. I died the day I got saved. Come on. How can you, how can you kill a person who's been dead? God is looking for the even if Christians. Do I have anybody in this place that says, you know what? I, f I have the fear of God more than I have the fear of the government. Because that's what it was. That's what it was in this time. This was the government rising up against them. Rising up against the God that they stood for. And they had to make a decision whether I fear the government or whether I have a fear of God. And I'm telling you today, I don't know if this is going to happen, but there's a good chance that it might. There's going to come a time where we might be persecuted. And you got to make a decision whether you're going to stand for Jesus and risk your life for it. Whether you're going to preach the gospel and risk your life for it. Or just back down and act like you never knew him. Come on now. Christians in other places of the world right now are praising and worshiping God, putting their lives on the line. Because it's legal there. And if they get caught, they get killed. But they don't care. You know why? Because they've been dead. And they're not tripping. You know why? Because if they die, it's graduation. It's not death. It's just graduation. Go ahead and kill me, but I'm just graduating. I to meet my father. Fear of God or fear of government? Or how about this? Even, even less than that. Let's take it a step, step down. Fear of God or fear of man's opinion? Because I've been there where God told me to pray for somebody and I'm scared of what everybody else in the room is going to say. Well, what if, what if I pray for him and then somebody else doesn't like that I'm, that I'm praying for this person? And I have to check myself. God's telling me. God, God begins to speak to me. He says, do you fear man more than you fear me? You, you like their acceptance more than you like the acceptance of the king? 
I'm talking about the creator of the universe. You like their acceptance more than you like the creator of the universe's acceptance? You need to come to a place where you understand you're accepted by God and nobody can do anything to take that from you. So it doesn't matter what they think about you. It doesn't matter what they say about you because you can't reject me because God's already accepted me. So step out and pray. Step out and preach the gospel. You know why I say that? Because you'll never make history if you don't. That's what we're talking about tonight. You'll never make history if you sit down. Quiet people won't make history. Shallow people won't make history. Skeptics won't make history. Sideline watchers won't make history. People who are in the game will make history. People who stand up will make history. People who let their voice be heard will make history. People who preach the gospel will be remembered. You leave a legacy when you live for Jesus. You leave a legacy when you live for Jesus. Then it says this, that that's the second time, everybody say second time. That's the second time that these three men were given a chance to bow. How many know the devil always give you a second chance to go back? The devil will always give you a second chance to go back to your old life. So I'm here to tell you tonight, you got nothing to lose. Because if you come in here today and you want your old life back, the devil will be more than happy to deposit everything he took from you back. to put it all back in. But tonight, you might as well say, God, what do you have in store for me? God, what do you have in store for me? I've tried everything. That's the place I had to come to in my life. I tried everything, God. I tried the drugs. I tried the alcohol. And it's not working. Let's see what you have in store for me, Lord. Isaiah did it at one point in his life. We all have to come to this place where we say, God, it's all yours. Here we go. Then these three men were bound and cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Because the furnace was exceedingly hot. The flame and the fire killed those men. Those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Somebody say your, your haters are going to burn. I'm just kidding. But it is, it's not a coincidence that the same people that were coming up against him were the same ones that were burned. So you can talk about me, you can hate on me, but you're just hurting yourself. Because I'm a child of the Most High King. I'm a child of the Most High King. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. Everybody say astonished. And said this, everybody, this is the part right here you got to get. Did we not cast three men into the fire? And they said, yes, true, okay, true. Then he said, look, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. And they're not hurt. And the fourth one is in the form of the Son of God. There's a fourth man in the fire. And check this out. It says, in the form, the fourth one is like the Son of God. See, they recognize Jesus on us. They recognize Jesus on you. They recognize when you're sporting the real Jesus. When you got the real power. Man, I can, I can spot when somebody's not really living this Christianity thing. I can spot when somebody's not rocking the real Jesus, when somebody's not really spending time with God, when somebody's compromising, when somebody's in secret sin, when somebody's not really the, living the life that they say they're living. But when you stand up, and when you're committed like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and when you begin to live loyal to God, and when you begin to rise up when everybody else is sitting down, the world will look in and be like, they got the real Jesus. They look like they have Jesus with them. They look like they have power with them. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. You're talking about the very dude who set up the gold image? The very dude who was threatening their life because of the God they serve is now admitting that they serve the Most High God? Is now admitting that their God is the way, the truth, and the life? The same people that rise up against you and tell you that you're nobody, the same people that rise up against you and tell you you're never going to be nothing, when God begins to raise you up and God begins to exalt you because you're staying loyal to him in the secret place, those are going to be the very ones that say, oh yeah, oh yeah, I knew it, I knew it, yeah. Yeah, they were, oh yeah, they were always going to be something. See, they recognize 
They recognize when greatness is happening. Check this out. And it says, servants of the most high God, come out and come here. Can we get that music on my sister in the back? Come out and come here. So they came out and everyone saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair on their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected. And the smell of fire was not on them. See, y'all don't know, but I've been through fire, but I don't even smell like it. Because Jesus came. I've been through fire. You know, some of you guys don't even know the drug addiction I was in. Some of you guys don't know the fire that I walked through. But because Jesus came and he, and he cleaned everything up, you don't, even, you don't even realize. So there's some people, my cousin Isaiah, he's been through fire in his life. Don't even smell like smoke. Because when Jesus comes and repairs, and when Jesus comes and restores, he doesn't do a halfway job. He doesn't leave scars, but he repairs and restores holy. My, my wife told her brother one day my testimony. He said, your, your, your husband was never on drugs. He's lying to you. He said, and it, it makes me want to cry because I think that it's a, it's, it's a miracle. He said, your husband never did the stuff he said. He, he's lying to you. And I begin to say, thank you, Jesus, that I don't look like what I've been through. Thank you, Jesus, that I don't look like what I've been through. Thank you that you came and made a sinner like me beautiful and didn't deserve it. Thank you that I don't smell like smoke even though I've been through the fire. And we want to offer that invitation to you today. This is the moment right here. I'm not going to build it up anymore. We want to offer that invitation to you today. If you want God to come and restore you, the fire that you've been through, the struggles that you've had, only you know about. And you want God to come and restore your heart. You want God to come and restore your life. And you want him to save you. And you want to receive the power of God on your life. I want you to just close your eyes right now. Every eye closed, every head bowed in this place. You say, you know what? I want to surrender to you, God. This message was for me. This word was for me. I'm ready to surrender my life to you, God. Wholeheartedly, God. I want to be like the three men. I want to be like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Not bowing down to the gods of this culture. But bowing down to you, Father. I want to live for you committed. I want to live for you loyal. I want to live for you fully surrendered to you, Jesus. If that's you, I want you to stand up right now. I want you to stand up right now. Don't worry about what the person next to you is thinking. Every eye closed and every head bowed still at this moment. And if you're ready, you say, God, it's all yours. My life is all yours. I want to make history for you, Jesus. I want to live for you, Jesus. I want to shake the world for you, Jesus. I want to leave a legacy for my children, my grandchildren. I want to change the world for you, Jesus, because I know you created me for greatness, Father. If that's you, I just want you to come up right now. Just come up here. Just come up to the front. I'm not trying to embarrass you. We're not here to embarrass you. Just come up to the front and give it all to God. God, I give you my life. God, I give you my soul. I give you everything that I have inside of me, Lord. I want to stand for you wholeheartedly, God. I want to do your will, God. I want to do your work, God. I want to be used in the kingdom for you, Father. You're worthy of my yes. You're worthy of my surrender, Jesus. So I lay it down for you, God. We sang that song during worship. I found my life when I laid it down. You're going to find your life tonight when you lay it down at the feet of Christ.
your heart. 